please welcome Christoph Koch. Keep clapping. Thank you. You're welcome. You heard from Afira how uh, Brian Green is willing to help support the moth. Listen to this. I'm willing to have a date with one of you for a mere thousand dollars. No question asked what happens. What happens in New York stays in New York. It was in the late 1990s, and um, I was course director at the Marine Biological Lab in uh, Woods Hole in Cape Cod, directing a class on how computers can be used to uh, learn uh, about the brain. And we're celebrating with a boisterous evening with a big uh, dinner party and a live rock and roll band. And I freely indulged in, um, in dancing and drinking. But then I grew restless. I'd read the previous couple of days a book by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. <laughs> this is not funny. <laughs> uh, about how modernity had killed God and uh, how uh, we are all God's grave digger, diggers and about divine putrefaction. And this had reawakened this long simmering conflict I've had between my religious upbringing and my um, profession as a scientist. So I wandered off. I left the party and I wandered off through the forest to the beach in Cape Cod. And um, when I arrived at the beach, was, uh, there was a crescent moon which was partly obscured by the clouds that were being chased across the sky by the, the wind which it's picked up to storm. And the storm had also driven the, the whites of the waves towards the land. And it was this desolate, empty beach, you know, just a couple of boulders. In the background, there were the, the, the trees that were swaying, very menacing. And uh, I was quite, ex I, had to, uh, I went through this existentialist crisis and I shouted out to the sky, Gott, wo bist du? See, God speaks German, of course. <laughs> I was. Um, I was uh, shouting for God to reveal himself. He, I was trying for many years to desperately believe in him, but I never had a sign of his existence. So I, I, was, I, was, I was debating with him. Well, it was a very one-sided debate. There was a problem. I was debating with him that to, sh to, to show himself, I needed a booming voice from the sky. I wanted a burning bush. I, I wanted some sign. And, and I increased, you know, because I drank a lot, I was very bellicose and was very insistent. <laughs> And then suddenly, uh, the earth erupted in front of me. And uh, there was this bright light that, that dazzled me. And this very angry form metamorphosed just right in front of me, just materialized. And it was shrieking and yelling, get the fuck off this beach. So God had metamorphosed from a, into an angry camper. He <laughs> was trying to sleep there and I'd awaken him and I hadn't noticed him before. <laughs> so I grew up uh, happy, raised by my, by my uh, parents in the best liberal Catholic tradition, where by and large science, including um, evolution by natural selection, was accepted as explaining the facts of the world. I, um, I was an altar boy, I learned to say the prayers in, in Latin, and I loved, I, I really loved uh, the masses and the passion and the requiems of Orlando de Lassos and Verdi and, uh, and Bach. For my, uh, as a teenager, my dad gave me a five inch reflector telescope, and I still rev uh, very viscerally remember the night when I, on the top of my house, I point, I calculated actually where the planet Uranus should be in the sky. And I pointed the telescope at the azimut and the elevation, and right there it appeared. And I, I remember this incredible feeling of elation I felt, this, this, this ordered universe that I found myself in, where I can actually compute these things, like this, this blue pl uh, planet that gently drifted into view. 
But then over the years, I, I began to reject a lot of the, the things that, that the Catholic Church told me. See, on, on, on the one hand, there were these things my parents and my Jesuit teacher told me. On the other hand, I, I learned to, uh, to listen to the beat of a very different drama in, my, in lectures and in books and in the lab. So I had this, this explanation for things in the world for the Sunday, and then I had another explanation for the rest of the week. There was a sacred explanation, and there was this profane explanation. And on the one hand, I was told, I sort of, uh, my life was given meaning by, by putting it in the context of this large scale, you know, there's this large creation of God, and I'm just a puny part of it. On the other hand, science actually explained actual facts about the real universe I found myself in. And so for many decades, I, I had this profound uh, split of reality. And then I met uh, Francis Crick. So Francis, uh, I, met Fra I first encountered Francis under an apple tree, doing what he loved best, which was uh, talking and discussing about biology. The Francis Crick was the, um, uh, the physical chemist who, um, who discovered the double helical structure of the molecule of heredity DNA, a discovery for which he was given the, Nobe uh, the Nobel Prize. It was really to him and his uh, guiding intellect that the field of molecular biology looked in their giddy and exuberant race to discover the, the universal code of life. And when that goal was achieved in the late 60s, he shifted his interest from molecular biology to um, trying to understand how consciousness arises out of the physical brain. And, um, and that's when I encountered him, and we grew quite fond and close to each other. We worked together for, for close to two decades. We, uh, we published two books, uh, we, uh, we wrote uh, two dozen papers, and we published several books, and he dedicated his last book to me. Francis also sort of epitomizes the, the historical animosity between religion and science. And this, um, this really grew legendary uh, in 1961, when Francis resigned very publicly, you can read about it, uh, from, the, from Churchill College in, in Cambridge, England. Um, at the occasion of the Churchill College um, constructing a, um, a, ch a chapel on college ground, Francis felt uh, that a, a new college dedicated to science and mathematics and engineering, there was no place for superstition. Winston Churchill, in whose name the, the college had been founded after the war, tried to appease Francis and wrote him a letter pointing out that the financial means to, uh, for the construction of the cathedral would be, uh, of the chapel would be raised entirely by private means, that would be open uh, to uh, people of any faith, and that nobody would be forced to attend. Francis replied by, uh, by return post, proposing the construction of a brothel. <laughs> a bordel. It would, the construction of the bordel would be financed entirely by private means. <laughs> it would be open to all men, no matter what their religious conviction, and no man would be forced to attend. <laughs> and he actually included a check for down payment. So uh, this ended the, the correspondence between the two great men. <laughs> By the time I uh, knew Francis, his, um, his um, animosity vis-a-vis -vis religion had become muted. And although he knew I was raised Catholic and uh, sporadically attended Mass, he uh, never probed. I think finally he was, um, he was a kind man, and he, didn't, he wanted to spare me the, the embarrassment for groping for an explanation, in particular as my belief uh, obviously didn't interfere with our quest to understand how, con how the conscious mind arises out of the brain within an entire natural uh, framework. Um, and for emotional reasons, I wasn't ready to give up my, my, my faith, and I was also afraid, I was simply afraid that his searing intellect would be, uh, I, I couldn't be matched my, by, by anything I could, I could sort of, um, I could explain why I believed things. Many years in our, in our collaboration, when I visited him in, in San Diego where he lived, he told me in a very matter-of-fact tone that his colon cancer, he had a previous bout with colon cancer, probably had returned and that he was expecting a call from his oncologist later on that day um, discussing the results of some tests they'd run the previous days. I was actually with him in the study, that's how we worked, in the study at home, uh, when the call came, confirming that uh, cancer had returned with a vengeance. And um, 
He stared off for a minute or two into space after he put down the phone. And um, then he returned to our conversation about, about brains. At lunch, he discussed his diagnosis with his wife, talking about what needs to be done to accommodate him. But for the rest of the day, we worked. That was it. There was no doom and gloom. There was no gnashing of teeth. There was no tears. It, was, it, it, it impressed me immensely, this, this stoic, I mean, this living embodiment of a, of a stoic, of this ancient stoic faith, except what you can't change. A couple of months later, when again I visited him, we went as usually through his large correspondence pertaining to consciousness. And there was a letter from a, from a famous British philosopher confessing to Francis, was a personal letter, confessing to Francis his, his, uh, the philosopher's abject fear when faced with the idea of his own mortality. He wrote, quote, I feel like an animal, cornered, absolutely terrified, panicky, unable to think clearly when contemplating my own demise. And then I, I finally brought up the strength to ask him, apropos that letter, Francis, how do you feel about, about your diagnosis, studiously avoiding any mentioning of the word death? And he again, he was very much down to earth. He said something like, everything that has a beginning must have an end. Those are the facts. I don't like them, but I've accepted them. And I will not take any heroic measures to prolong my life beyond the inevitable. I am resolved to live my life out uh, with intact mind. And so he did. Over the next uh, two years, as, his, uh, as the cancer weakened his body, but never his spirit, we continued to write. We finished my book. And I, I was just immensely, immensely impressed by, by how he could deal with this. And I, I, of course, reflected on my own future demise and w whether I would be able to have this, this calmness, this composure to meet my own end. Suffering from the debilitating effect of uh, chemotherapy, I heard him one day on the phone talking with somebody who was trying to convince him to sign off on the construction of a bobblehead of him. Okay, because Francis Crick is a very famous figure, they wanted to construct a bobblehead of him. <laughs> At some point, I heard him put down the phone. He walked past me, shuffling past me on the way to the bathroom. When he returned several minutes later to resume the conversation, he just sort of dryly remarked to me in passing, well, now I can truly say this idea made me throw up. <laughs> Finally, he called me to say, uh, Christoph, um, the correction to our paper we're working on turned out to be our last paper. We're going to be delayed. I have to go to the hospital for a couple of days, but don't worry. In the hospital, he continued to dictate um, corrections to this paper to his uh, assistant. Two days later, he passed away. And uh, his wife, Odile, told me how on his deathbed, he had this hallucinatory conversation with me involving neurons and their connection to consciousness. A scientist literally to his last breath. Given the 40 years age difference, we fell into this very natural father-son relationship. And uh, we, we, we became very close, close comp intellectual companions. And, and he became my hero for the unflinching way he dealt with, with, with mortality and, and, uh, and um, aging. With a view towards the inevitable, he gave me a, a, life, a huge portrait of him, a life size portrait of him. Um, of Francis sitting in a wicker chair, gazing out at me with a twinkle in his eyes, signed, for Christoph Francis keeping an eye on you. <laughs> and so it does today in, in my office. I've never had another encounter with God, nor do I expect to, for the God I now believe in is, is much closer to Spinoza's God than the God of Michelangelo's painter or the God of the Old Testament. I <laughs> I'm sort of saddened by the belief of my, uh, by the loss of my belief in, 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 in religion. It's like leaving forever the comfort of your childhood home, suffused with the warm glows and, and fond memory. But I do believe we all have to grow up. It's difficult for many, it's unbearable to the few. But we have to see the world as it really is. And we have to stop thinking in terms of, in terms of magic. As Francis would have put it, this is a story for grown men, not a consoling tale for children. 
And so here I am, seven years later. I'm a highly organized pattern of, of, of mass and energy, one of seven billion. In any objective accounting of the universe, I'm practically nothing. And soon I'll, I'll cease to be. But um, the, the certainty of my own demise, the certainty of my own death, sort of somehow makes my life more meaningful. And I think that is as it should be. I find myself born into this universe. It's a wonderful place, it's a strange place, it's also a scary and sometimes lonely place. What I try to do every day in my work, I try to discern through its noisy, through its noisy manifestation. I try to discern through its noisy manifestation, it's, it's the people, the dogs, trees, mountains, stars, everything I love. I try to discern the eternal music of the spheres. Thank you very much.